Well, hello there and welcome to Travels with Jordy. If this is your first visit, my name is Peter Knowles and I live on this classic wood motor cruiser here in Victoria, British Columbia, along with the loving memory of my pup, Jordy. All the while fixing it up for some pretty ambitious cruising. If that's the sort of thing you might find interesting, please consider sticking around and subscribing. I'd love to have you. This week is going to be back to wiring and I should make it clear I actually really enjoy wiring I think I might have given the impression that I don't last week because I was working on that relatively confined area in the helm the thing is I really enjoy wiring because it's satisfying to do it really well and if you can't achieve that level of satisfaction well you're, you're kind of climbing uphill all the time anyway I think I've got that surmounted and the work we're gonna do this week is well it's equally frustrating but I think again We'll persevere. Okay, well this should be getting to the fun part. We have an electrical panel. Well, most of one. We have a helm. Well, again, most of one. Um, most of the AC circuits are wired. There's a few uh, duplex boxes to be put on still, but almost no DC circuits. In fact, no proper DC circuits are wired yet. I do have two proper DC circuits down to the bilge pumps because of course it's a wooden boat and bilge pumps are the most important thing. For those of you who are curious, the bilge pumps hardly run at all anymore. Um, if you've been following along since last summer's haul out where yes, it took a while to swell up. Uh, I think I probably pump out a liter a day. Maybe, maybe not even half a liter a day. The pump goes every eight to 10 hours for you know a couple of cups so very very pleased with that okay so we need to put in some actual circuits well you can see we do have lighting and we do have a water pump but they're kind of temporarily wired with some wires that are dangling in various areas that uh, you know, don't really make much sense anyway so it's time to actually pull some proper wiring and connect them up to the panel properly but most significantly of the wiring that i need to put in is the navigation lights uh, which includes um, the red and green side marker lights, a steaming light forward because this is a large motor cruiser, a uh, stern light facing aft, also white, and uh, that's it for navigation lights, but then also an anchor light, and I'm going to wire for a future spotlight that I may have here someday, hopefully. Um, I need those because if I'm going to cruise uh, anytime near dusk, you're supposed to have navigation lights, and last summer I didn't. But of course, I didn't do any uh, cruising in the evening, Coast Guard. Uh, not to worry. Uh, so let's get on with those. Okay, so the problem with that, and why am I getting on to this? Well, this, uh, well, it's hidden here by this little uh, stitch work of Jordy. Let me just move him for a second. Uh, that hole right there goes out to where the side marker navigate, the colored light goes, and it'll be wired up into the overheads here, as well as the lights that go up the mast, which include the anchor light and the forward steaming light, all go up that new temporary mast, but the wiring will be permanent, so I have to make sure I leave enough in it. Now, should we go upstairs? Let's go upstairs. All right then, well, let's revisit the temporary mast, which is here and uh, we put this on last summer in anticipation of getting these lights on there. So what will go on here at the very top will go the anchor light. Uh, here will go the forward steaming light. And uh, underneath here will go a horn, which I've ordered and should be here soon. Uh, right on top of here is going to go the uh, Wi-Fi um, cellular network antenna. So there's quite a few wires here that have to be fed down to the helm and the main panel. And they're all gonna work their way down right about here somewhere because there's going to be an upper helm. Many of you have asked, um, here's the remnants of the old upper helm, uh, sort of a mess, but anyway, needs to be all ripped out. As you know, all of this is gonna be redone soon this summer. So the upper helm will be a uh, pedestal here uh, in mahogany. Uh, that'll sit right here on top of the deck and be open to below. It needs to be open because, of course, wires need to go down, but also the control cables for the engine and the transmission, as well as the steering cables, have to be able to pass through here. And we'll talk about that when I get to it. But more importantly for now, we just need to get some wires through. So the wires that come off the mast are going to work their way through a hole right here in the middle of the windshield and then into this uh, pedestal and then down into the overheads uh, below. Again, the thing about wiring on a boat at least is that routing, figuring out how all these wires are going to go is a bit complex. Not so much for doing it the first time, but making sure it's serviceable in the future. Especially when I'm going to be completely rebuilding the windshield, completely rebuilding. All of this has to come apart again, but I need to be legal and uh, useful to be able to cruise this summer. So 
that means drilling some holes. Okay, so we know where the wires are gonna go upstairs, but they're gonna pop out basically right here somewhere. Well, that's not very convenient. So they're gonna run in the overheads along and across and down to the helm somewhere. Well, how am I gonna do that? On some boats, sometimes you'll see um, a, a metal pipe here, um, sort of like a pole. It looks like a grab pole, but it's actually a cheat. It's used to carry the wiring and uh, cable controls from an upper helm. Often a boat that has a um, flybridge directly above the regular bridge, that stuff just comes straight down and it's fairly easy to run. Now I don't want one of those poles, um, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna take a tip from MV Zephyrus. On MV Zephyrus, this piece of wood was actually hollowed out on the backside and wires were run in behind it as a wire chase. Uh, that's all very well. The downside of it, it does mean I have to drill a slot in this beam up here, as well as in the deck down here. Uh, neither of which is a problem, neither of which is a structural consideration, but it's drilling holes in the original wood of the boat and that always makes me feel a little funny, but Anyway, it's got to be done. It's going to work out just fine. I don't have to run many wires up here. Just a few. There comes one bung. And the other one. There we go. The balance of the fasteners here are some finish nails, which I should be able to just pull out. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right, I can tell you that is not the sort of work I enjoy. Anyway, so I'm gonna have to drill through this beam um, and it would be great if there wasn't a cross beam in the way and it looks like it's okay. In fact, I should have known it was right there because that's how this is attached. Uh, so I can easily pop up there with my wires above and going down, um, there's nothing significant under here. Uh, I may run into a fastener or two from this, but we'll see how we do. Yuck. And then to connect them together, again a bit ugly. Well, I can't say I'm at the least bit proud of that kind of work. It's hardly uh, carpentry, but uh, it's effective. And uh, what I was really pleased is that there was no dampness in that wood at all. So I don't have any weeping coming from outside, which is good because um, that would have continued to, uh, to uh, reinforce that problem. So actually this has turned out really, really well. And I have room for a good 10 or so wires here, which I shouldn't need. <laughs> and just a little bit of rotary file work to uh, ease the edge there. And actually, I would say that is a darn good slot. All right, now if this project isn't a never ending series of things I dread doing, that's done. Now I have to take the overheads down or at least enough of it to get through to here. And uh, they're not really installed properly. No, no, no. These are just strips of cheap hardware store masonite um, uh, held in place right now with tiny little uh, air nails and the lighting strip at the edge. So I'm kind of hoping I can just pull the strip down and p anyway, we're going to find out more about this in the next few minutes. Okay then. Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. What I've done, I've put uh, some screws um, at a point where I don't want it to fall down any further uh, because these tiny little 23 gauge uh, pins will collapse out pretty easy. So there's lots of them up there. We'll go explore that in a little bit. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, good morning then. So I've cleared enough uh, rooting that I can get through 
in the overheads and up and it's time now to drill a hole through the uh, cabin top up into the space where the future helm will go. Again, this will all be cut out at some point and there'll be some serious structure to support that new helm pedestal that's gonna go up here. And uh, I mentioned the wires will all come down and go through the overheads, but uh, two things will have to come straight down through here and that is the steering cables and the control cables, the Morse cables for the engine controls. And very much like I mentioned <laughs> at the helm, uh, some uh, boats use a pole there at the helm. Well, I am actually gonna have a pole right here, except it'll be a two inch brass handrail, uh, which will also be on, on stanchions here, on a little standoff. So it'll also create a bit of a handhold as one goes through the companionway here. But secretly, uh, you and I will know that there's actually cables, uh, steering cables running through that. Anyway. That's this summer. Uh, in the meantime, we just need to drill a hole. Perfect. Now, as I mentioned, I'm also going to have to cut a hole through here to get through to the wire chase that I put in the mast that will serve both um, the steaming light and the anchor light, uh, as well as the horn and some wires for the uh, Wi-Fi antenna. So I'm gonna just drill straight through here. Um, obviously there's be no glass that far in. Uh, again, this is all going to be rebuilt. Oh, that won't do. There we go. Okay. Okay, I haven't been able to drill through yet, and uh, you can see that the shoulder of the arbor is not going to allow me to go any deeper. Well, I'm going to try a trick that I've, to be honest, never actually done, but I've read about it, and it seems to make sense. So what you do, you take a larger hole saw, and you spin it onto the arbor first, and then you put the actual one that you were drilling with back on, and that acts as a guide. Now, if I can actually lock both these arbors at the same time, I'll be really impressed. Let's see, that one's locked, and uh, that one's not locked, but it won't matter because it's not cutting. Okay, so the inner drill, the inner saw, will act as a guide. In other words, in the hole that I'm already working on, and the outer saw will cut my clearance hole larger than the arbor. I'm gonna say that's as far as I have to go. I'll just break this stuff out. There we go. Set this back to its other mode. And now I have enough clearance for the arbor to go all the way through. And here's the uh, antenna for the Pepwave um, cellular router. Now, uh, I'll go into this in detail uh, probably in another episode. I talked about the one that I put on MV Zephyrus this summer. Uh, but basically, it's the antenna and has seven antennas in it um, for the cellular uh, router system that I use, and it works awesome. Anyway, I'm going to put it right here, and that means drilling a hole right there and fishing these wires down and through. There we go. And run the nut back up. Well, I have to say, I did not design this platform for this antenna, but it certainly worked out well. So the reason I wanted to do the antenna first is because the cable bundle has all these connectors on the end and I wanted to make sure that they went through the hole uh, before it got too uh, constricted with the other wires uh, because you can always shove a bare wire through. So this is probably going to end up, I have a feeling uh, the router is going to end up on top of my glassware cabinet up in here. So anyway, I'm not quite sure uh, because that's as much wire as I have. I suppose I could, get, no. Yeah, that's about it. Anyway, okay, time to pull some actual wire. So, my thoughts on uh, pulling wire like this when you're putting quite a few wires in at once is to run your longest runs first. 
um, unless you have an unlimited spool. Uh, I have a s whole bunch of 25 foot spools of this wire, and uh, which is um, Anchor 142 uh, Marine Tinned Wire, which I'm using for everything on the DC circuit, pretty much. So. Um, because you want to make sure you don't have too much waste, you run your longest runs first and then try to use the remainder of the spool for exactly the length. So you end up with a ton of, you know, little lengths of wire around that you're trying to use up well because this stuff is not cheap. Okay, so I'm going to run it straight from the helm because this first circuit is going to be the anchor light. And the anchor light isn't spliced. Ooh, there's some waves coming in. The anchor light isn't tied into anything else. Basically, the switch at the helm here turns the light on at the top of the mast. That's all it does. So it's a single run. So let's start to run this out and around. Okay, I need to talk to you about that. But first I want to talk about crimping tools. These are the two official Anchor brand crimping tools that are used with Anchor quality marine terminals. And the one on the right is used with the terminals that have the nylon insulator, basically the non shrink tube style insulator. And the one on the left is used with the shrink tube style insulation. And there's a subtle difference to the way they crimp. Let's start with the non shrink tube style. If you look at the mandrels, in other words, the teeth where it squeezes, crimps them, there's actually two sets of mandrels on this crimper. And the reason is when you crimp these, uh, these terminals, let me just chalk it up here. The uh, mandrel on the outside crimps through the nylon to the metal and crimps it really tight on the wire. At the back, it's a slightly larger mandrel around just the plastic. So if we put the wire in here and set this up for a crimp, I'll crimp that down. And we can see that it is crimped it quite nicely through and, uh, and not overly crimp the plastic. It makes a fine crimp. Okay, let's look at the other end. The mandrels on the crimper for the heat shrink terminals are really just pinchers. They're, they don't actually uh, support it on all four sides. They just sort of pinch it in the middle. And as a result, uh, as you put the terminal in here, I'll just put this one in here, chuck it up properly, insert the wire, and crimp. You can see that it crimps it basically right through the uh, heat shrink and onto the metal inside without damaging or touching at all the heat shrink portion of it. So when we shrink this with a heat gun, there's no nicks or anything and that will shrink tight on that. Now, I have a problem with that. And that problem can be illustrated quite simply. The reason that came apart so easily is because if you look in there, and I don't know if you can see, let me bring it up to the camera, the actual ring or tube that the uh, wire was crimped in is actually just squished from a circle to an oval. In other words, as it was crimped down, it also got wider and it doesn't make a very good crimp at all. And that's because the mandrels are simply squeezing it in one direction and allowing it to spread in the other direction. Where? If you look at the mandrels in the other tool, you'll notice it's a captive mandrel. What happens is, as it starts to squeeze it, the sides are held in by these extended uh, sort of tongs here. And as it's crushed down, the uh, tube cannot uh, widen. In fact, it's crushed and basically held on all four sides and makes a much higher quality crimp. Now you might say, the other side, also crimping, is going to damage the heat shrink material and uh, make, make it uh, not shrink properly, but let me show you. Okay, so for me, this thing is rubbish. Never ever use it. I actually use the heat shrink style connectors in the um, crimper designed for the non heat shrink style. So you say, well, won't that cause a problem damaging the plastic? Okay, so let's set this up and do a crimp. Okay, so I've done a great crimp 
through the nylon, through the uh, heat shrink material onto the metal. That is well crimped. And okay, yeah, there is the slightest perception of damage down here, but wait. And there you go. By the time you actually shrink it, it self heals into a perfect, perfect shrink. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is the insulation. If you look carefully, you'll be able to see that the insulation is actually creeping up towards the hole in this ring terminal. And this is common in all the brands of quality terminals I found, including Anchor and the other well-known good name brands. So what that means is when you put a screw in here, the screw is sitting on the shoulder of that little bit of plastic. It's not making good contact with the ring terminal itself. It's even worse when you put it into a terminal. I mean, when you put it into a, like in this case, a um, terminal block, that plastic is actually insulating um, the screw and the ring from the plate on the block. And that's a problem. Yes, there will be some contact because the screw is touching the ring terminal and it may touch a little bit on the far side, but you have a vastly reduced conductivity, in other words, surface area through this terminal. And this is rampant. At least 80% of every terminal I put together, I have to come along later and take a knife and actually cut off the last little bit of uh, that insulation along the edge of the terminal so I can be certain that I'm not in a situation where I don't have a complete metal to metal contact when I make a connection. I can't believe that this exists, uh, but be wary of it and be very, very careful to make sure that if you're using heat shrink terminals, they're not, the heat shrink isn't crowding the hole so that the screw is not making good contact. Rant mode off. All right, so, so far we have a horn wire. This is gonna be the anchor light wire. The horn's gonna stay down here because actually the horn is a compressed air horn and the compressor will sit inside the upper helm here. So it doesn't need to go any further, but this wire will send up. And up in this little dado, I cut in the back of the mast and up through a little hole. I put in the base of the anchor light pad here and we're set. Okay, we're really moving along here. What have we got? We've got a horn, we've got anchor light. Next is navigation lights and they're a little more complicated because they go to a few destinations. Yes, the bayonet bulb holders in here can get a bit gnarly and this is a good example of very, very gnarly. Now, the interesting thing is they're simple little uh, uh, bulb holders that are just actually friction fit into the casting here. So if I can just pull this one out of here for you for a sec. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, the bayonet fitting just pulls right out of the little sort of crimp, not crimp, but holder in there. So all we need is a new one of these. Lo and behold, they're readily available. In fact, this is actually a marine unit. Uh, what I don't know yet, um, if it's actually tinned wire. Let's find out. All right. Yes, indeed, beautiful, beautiful. It's actually tinned wire. So these might be quite a nice little unit. They're touted as being marine quality. So all I do now is simply slide that back in here and it's good to go. How easy is that? I got these on Amazon. I'll put a link below as to uh, where I got them from. Uh, can I take some of the wickedness out of this wire? Taking the wickedness out of it. That's a quote from Arthur Ransom. If you can tell me what book that came from, taking the wickedness out of it, if I remember it correctly. All right, Boy, it gets hot. So now I need to make a splice. So here's the main navigation light feed wire coming aft, and I'm going to splice into it two wires. One that's going to go out through the side of the boat to the side marker light, and one that's going to carry on um, to the base of the mast and off again. So my technique for splicing is as such. Normally, if you're gonna do a butt connection, this is a 14 gauge wire, you'd use the uh, 14, 16 size terminals, slide it over, crimp it, shrink it, butt, done. If you wanna be able to use a butt connector to make a uh, splice, use the next size up. These are the size 10, 12. And what you can do is you can take 
the two wires and twist them together. Whoop, my bench is a bit slopey here. And twist them together, make sure they're really well aligned. Twist them together and slide the next size largest butt connector over it and make the connection. And we're on. Beauty. We'll do the negative. Nice. Okay, now to attach the feed wire into these, you say, okay, well, these wires are too small. Well, you can get step down um, butt splice connectors. In other words, it'd be 10, 12 on one side and 14, 16 on the other. <laughs> they're hard to find, they're rare, they're hard to keep in inventory. I find a much simpler way is to simply take the wire, fold it over. You've seen me do this before. And now I have twice as much wire and uh, that'll make a fantastic butt connection. Make sure I get my colors right here. And around and up. Okay. Of course, I'll replace all these bulbs with LED as soon as I can find just the perfect ones. Now, to be fair, there's one more navigation light, and that's the stern light. And it had been here mounted to this stanchion, and I had actually already wired it some years ago, albeit with red black wire, which I don't use anymore. I'm not going to put the light here for a bunch of reasons. One, these stanchions are going. The other is this. Granted, this is now in the down position, but even then, with it in the up position, I don't think it would be a suitable navigation light. So, in lieu of putting one on the transom, which I don't really want to do, I'm going to put it on the back edge of the upper bimini there. And actually, there's going to be a few things up there. I think my flag is probably going to go there as well. So, that's yet to be done because I have yet to find just the perfect light. I have a nice high intensity LED bulb for this. And that'll just go right in there. And now, <laughs> the most important part of this process is to not drop this in the ocean. Place this in the mount. I absolutely love the way that works. Okay, swing this around. These lights haven't been on the boat in years. And yes, I'll find some nice bronze screws for these. Yes, 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 yes. Hey! <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Well, we're only part way there, but we've advanced a little bit. Let's have a beer. Well, hello and welcome to Travels with Jordy Beer of the Week. Shot outside tonight because I just have to bask in the glow of my newly installed navigation lights. Aren't they beautiful? All right then, well, we're gonna go straight to the beer and that is an old standby. It is from Steamworks Brewery. It's their flagship IPA, which is one of the original uh, West Coast IPAs and it's absolutely fantastic. So let's get that going. It's so warm. It's so nice to be outside again. In fact, I could have shot this on the bridge deck, but then we wouldn't have that beautiful warm glow, would we? Okay, well, what a week. Another week of wiring, and it's not the last week of wiring, I can tell you. But I'm over the hump. From now on, it's just pulling wires and making things glow, or in some cases, honk or buzz or whatever it is they do. I've destroyed this pour. I'm not quite sure why, but um, how about I come back to you in a minute or two? All right, got this to a drinkable stage. All right, it's flagship IPA. It's a hazy from Steamworks and it's great. Mm. Yes, yes, yes it is. Okay, um, we'll run through this pretty quick. Uh, last week's winner of a Travels with Jordy uh, t-shirt is Peter Harvey. So congratulations, Peter, get a hold of me and we'll make sure you get your shirt. Mm. Also wanna thank um, a very generous supporter off the PayPal. Uh, system is John McMonagall. Thank you ever so much, John. I really, really appreciate it. Cheers. Man, that is a good beer. 
All that's left is the word of the week, and if you haven't guessed already, it's glow. Yes, of course. If you'd like to win a Travels Jordy t-shirt, simply use the word glow in a comment down below, and I'll pick it random over the next week or so's worth of comments, and if I pick you, you'll win a Travels with Jordy t-shirt. See you next week. Cheers. Mm.